Good evening. Uh, it's great to have you here. Happy New Year. This is the Universe Revealed, our Universe Revealed lecture series. Um, and this is a partnership between the University of Notre Dame, uh, Indiana University, South Bend, and then also the St. Joseph Public Library. The goal of this series is to provide a variety of topics um, and present them to the public so it's a chance for people who are interested in science, a wide range of topics, um, to just come out and um, participate and, and get engaged. Um, and so um, I will talk a little bit about uh, Professor Risk in just a moment. Um, just to plug in February, so generally we'll have one each month. The next one's coming up February 7th. Um, and this will be Cassie Brooks and Amy Stark, um, who will be talking about um, genetics and how that um, affects our health information. Um, so that's coming up February 7th. It'll be Tuesday at 6.30. To introduce tonight's speaker, um, Shahir Risk got his uh, PhD at Duke University in biochemistry and protein engineering. He then did a postdoc at University of Chicago. And he now is a professor at Indiana University South Bend. He's our biochemist. Uh, and he will be talking tonight about making sense of our senses. Uh, he is working on a book called What Color is North? And um, this will, it's exploring how proteins affect almost everything that you can imagine that we do. Um, and so this will probably be a little bit of foreshadowing, maybe, of what's in the book. That'll be coming out in the Harvard Press uh, 2024. And I will turn this over to Shahir. Thank you so much. Everybody can hear me OK? All right. So uh, again, my name is Shahir Risk. I am a, an associate professor of chemistry and biochemistry at IUSB. It's also where I went to school as a college student about two and a half billion years ago, somewhere around there. Um, and today, I really want to talk about how we perceive our world, how we sense the, the world around us uh, using one of my favorite molecules, which is proteins. Proteins. It's not one of my favorite. It is my favorite molecules. So uh, let's dive right into it. Well, let's start from the beginning. Uh, this is the town of Zagazig, Egypt. This is where I grew up. Uh, it's about the size of South Bend, but has a little bit, a few more people in it, about twice as, twice as many people, about the size of South Bend. Not a very big city. And uh, uh, this is me at about, I don't know, four years old, maybe, somewhere around there. And this is my mom, and this is my grandmother. And uh, when I was this old, this many years old and a little bit older, I spent a lot of time in my childhood with my grandmother. And I loved spending time with her because we used to cook a lot. We used to make food every day and all the time. And I love food. I love food. Everything about it is amazing. The smell, the taste, the color, even the sound when there's something sizzling. I love all of it. And one of my favorite things that we like to make is the Nile tilapia. Anybody like fish? Yeah, it's amazing. Well, here's a good recipe. This is an ancient recipe. I'm assuming it's an ancient recipe because anything that your grandma makes is ancient, right? So uh, you take the fish and um, you take garlic, lime, salt, and cumin, just those four things, right? Garlic, lime, salt, and cumin. And you grind everything together, you make a paste, and then you put it on the fish, and you deep fry it, deep fry it, with, with uh, flour, right? And it's amazing, tastes amazing. And to this day, I still make this recipe, I still use this recipe, and it still tastes amazing. And what really interests me is, how are we tasting things? How are we smelling things? How are we seeing things? Let's dive in a little bit and talk about the taste of smell. How about the science of taste? So if we zoom in on our tongues, stick your tongue out. Yeah, stick your tongue out. If you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in a little bit more, you'll see these bumps, these little bumps right here. They're taste buds, right? These little structures are basically taste buds. And the taste buds have a bunch of cells in them. A lot of cells in them. We have about 3,000 taste buds. Some people have about 5,000 taste buds. So they're, they're uh, what are they called? The super tasters? Super tasters, right? Uh, they're, they're the picky people, right? 
We still love them, but they're the picky people. They have about 5,000 or so, so lots of these taste buds. And each taste bud has a bunch of cells in it. And those cells are kind of like the hubs for tasting the world. And each uh, taste bud has about 50 to 100 cells. They're called gustatory cells, gustatory cells. Right? There's a bunch of other cells in there, but the, the business of what happens is in the gustatory cells. And those gustatory cells uh, basically help us taste those five flavors. These are the only five flavors that we know of that we can taste. Maybe there's more, but there's five types of taste that we can taste. Right? Sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and savory. Right? Savory, umami is another word for it. Those are just the five tastes that we can taste. And with those five tastes, we can taste everything that we can taste. And if we zoom in a little bit more and look at how these cells, the gustatory cells, actually work and what makes them find these taste molecules and latch onto them, we find that protein receptors are at the forefront. They're sitting right there at the front of the cell and they're receiving the molecules that we find in the food. They latch onto them and then they tell our brains that there's something salty or sweet or sour and so on. So if we dive in even more, we take a look at this structure right here. This is a structure of the bitter receptor protein that's called TAS2R46. It's just a name that we gave it because we have to file it somehow. But it has this, this kind of funny structure. It looks like uh, uh, wiggles or, or what, what does this look like? I don't know. All of that, yes, it looks like all of that. Yes, everything that you said. Uh, noodles, uh, it looks like noodles. Uh, there's actually precisely seven of them. If you count, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven of these noodles, and that's what makes up the protein structure. So the protein receptors, it's called a receptor because it receives the information from the molecules in our food. That's why we call it a receptor and it's a protein receptor, and it's really the tiny window to the world. It's a very, very tiny window to our world. Not just for taste, as we will see, but also for smell and for sight and for everything else. So, how tiny are these things? Let's take a look at this. Taste receptor is about 100 million times smaller than the cell that it lives on. How big are cells? Not very big, they're tiny. Even the cells on our taste bud are, are tiny. And the proteins that, are, that actually help us taste our food are 100 million times smaller than the cell that they live on. So if we were to take one of our cells, just take that cell, and blow it up, expand it, make it bigger, make it as big as this stadium. This is called Lucille Stadium. It's one of the stadiums they played the World Cup in just about a month ago in Qatar, right? Big stadium, it seats something like 80,000 people. So if you take that cell and blow it up to a stadium that's as big as a stadium that fills 80,000 people, how big do you think a protein would be? The protein would be the size of a Coke can. That's how small proteins are. A protein to a cell is about the size of a Coke can to a stadium. Proteins are very, very tiny. They are small. In fact, it's, it's nearly impossible to even see them with the most powerful microscopes we have. Very, very tiny. But they do so much for us. So what are proteins? We know that they're tiny. There's one of them that we learned about that helps us taste the world, right? But what are proteins? Well, how many of you like proteins? I love proteins because they come in all these amazing foods. Eggs, cheese, uh, my favorite, fava beans. Anybody had fava beans before? They are the best. Especially if you're Egyptian, you have to love fava beans. And it's just our national food. And also from meats, you know, hamburgers, steak, chicken, full of protein that we get from these organisms that we eat. And when we get those proteins, we break them down into things called amino acids. They're the building blocks of proteins. You break up proteins and you make individual amino acids. And then we take those amino acids and we rearrange them to make the proteins that make us who we are. So you take these amino acids and you build this handsome human being right here. Ruggedly handsome, if I may say so myself. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so it's only the beginning, guys. This is only the beginning. So we, we basically take proteins from the things that we eat and we build our own proteins that then we use to do all kinds of things. All kinds of things. 
And we all know about DNA. Everybody knows about DNA, hopefully, right? And what is DNA? DNA, people say DNA is the blueprint of life, right? The blueprint of life. It's kind of the instructions to making everything. And it's kind of like the stuff that you buy from Ikea, right? You buy something like, uh, like this, right? And it comes with instructions. It's this dresser right here. Uh, you can think of DNA as the instruction manual. DNA is the instruction manual. And the finished product is the protein, the dressel, that that functional unit is the protein. Now, the instructions are really important. The DNA is really important. The instructions are important, very, very important, but they're really useless in storing your clothes. The instruction manual is not going to store your clothes, but it will help you build this thing, the functional unit, where you can actually store your clothes. So DNA is like the blueprint, like the instruction manual. Proteins are the working machines of all living things, not just me or you, all living things. In fact, Proteins help us do all kinds of things, and they come in all kinds of shapes and very tiny sizes. And for example, they help us move. Proteins are in our muscles. Proteins that are like ropes that move against each other every time we flex our muscles or kick a soccer ball. Uh, they help us with reproduction, with sensing our environment, like our taste receptor protein, for example. They help us with defense. Anybody heard of antibodies? Antibodies are proteins that are immune system produces to fight diseases, right? Not only that, but some animals produce venom, like uh, snakes and uh, scorpions. They'll produce venoms for self-defense, and most of these, or a lot of them, are proteins. They'll just, you know, when they inject you with it, bad things will happen. They're also important for digestion and uh, most of the metabolic processes in our bodies. So uh, enzymes, for example, are a type of proteins that carry out a chemical reaction. They'll either break molecules apart or put them back together. So every time we digest a food, there are enzymes in our stomach and in our intestine that will break down the chemicals that we eat and use them to build up the chemicals that we need. And so we talked about taste receptors. How do they actually work? Here's an illustration of how a taste receptor works. Uh, if we Take a look at these wiggles right here, and we imagine that they're like fingers, right? Uh, so if you take your hands and go like this, everybody take your hands, go like this, right? And those are kind of the, the wiggles, the little, uh, uh, I don't know, what did we call them? The noodles? The noodles, right? Uh, it kind of makes like an open basket, right? An open basket, it's like a hand catching a ball. And over here, this is a bitter taste receptor, and this molecule here is called strychnine. This is found in a plant and it's pretty toxic, and to us, it's very, very bitter. If you taste it, your body's gonna say, I don't like this, this is bitter. And in fact, a lot of these toxins are bitter because we don't want them. We just say, oh, go away, we don't want you, right? But we like sweet things, don't we, right? Or if you're like me, you like salty things. I really like salty things, right? So, with five flavors, sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and savory, the vast majority have this kind of shape uh, more, more like a hand that's catching a ball. So as the molecules go over our tongues, these tiny, tiny proteins grab onto the tiny molecules in our food, and then they send a signal all the way up to our brain to say, this is good, this is bad, this is grandma's food, this is not grandma's food. That's important too. Now what about uh, the sense of smell? The sense of smell has these so-called smell receptors or olfactory receptors. Where do you think those live? Uh, nasal cavity all the way up to kind of the base of our brain. So our uh, nasal cavities lined with these uh, proteins. Again, they're tiny and they have that similar structure. Uh, count those noodles. How many noodles do you see here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Again, you know, they, they, they come from similar, they come from a related family of proteins, in fact. Right. They come from, they're kind of like cousins, right? And they do essentially the same thing. But taste receptors grab molecules from our food, and olfactory receptors grab molecules from the air every time you breathe. Every time you breathe. Okay. Now, we know that there's about five different types of taste receptors, right? The five different flavors, five different classes of taste receptors. How many smell receptors do you think we have? First of all, more or less? More, everybody's saying more, OK. 
Okay. Nobody's saying less? Saying less. Okay. Well, the answer is it's more. How many more? Six? Seven? Ten? Fifty? A hundred? A hundred? A hundred? Okay. Actually, we have about a thousand. A thousand. So imagine all the tastes that you can taste, that you've ever tasted in your life. You've used five types of taste receptors. But to smell, we have about a thousand. In fact, there's evidence that we have more of those, that they've just kind of disappeared over our evolution, that they've just kind of, our bodies just decided, uh, we don't really need that many, right? We have so much, so much more of these receptors for, uh, for this, the sense of smell than we do for the sense of taste. And these 1,000 are repeated for about a total of 6 million receptors just in the human nose. There's 6 million of them. Now, considering that they're really, really tiny, eh, that's a reasonable number to have, right? So they're repeated over and over and over again. And we can, it's, this is an estimation. I don't think anybody's ever counted this. We're estimated to smell or to be able to tell the difference between 1 billion different scents which of course are not gonna be just a single molecule, they're gonna be a combination of different molecules that are going to activate these different receptors in different ways. So you get about a billion different scents that you can tell. When you walk in, you're like, something doesn't smell right, right? They say, follow your nose. These are things that are very, very important because our noses are extremely sensitive and not just that, they are, they're very discriminatory. They can discriminate between things in an immense way, in an immense way. Now, we have six million or so lining our, what about this guy, dogs? 500 million, 500 million inside their noses. This is why dogs have this legendary sense of smell. And they can smell things from, you know, in very small amounts and they can smell, I mean, just if we can smell about a billion different smells with our 1,000 that are displayed 6 billion times, imagine how many more smells dogs can sniff. I mean, I can't even imagine living in a world like a dog. You must smell everything. Everything must smell to you. And it's no wonder that they can detect bombs, they can sniff out drugs, they can even sniff out cancers before some of our machines can detect them, right? Amazing, amazing animals. They can be annoying sometimes, but they're wonderful, right? Okay. I mean, it's just like most friends you have anyway, right? Okay. Now, why, why so many smell receptors? Why? Why do we just have five types of receptors for taste and a thousand for smell? Why? Because it's thought that smell is our most ancient sense. That's what we think, right? That it's the most ancient sense, that even bacteria were able to sniff their way around. And in fact, when you look at this bacteria right here, how big are bacteria? They're tiny, right? But they're not, they're still much, much larger than proteins, right? Because they are a cell, much smaller than our own cells. But if you look at this bacteria right here, at the very, very, very tip, just around, somewhere around here, if we zoom in, and we have to zoom in a lot, we have to zoom in a lot, we find that there are proteins again. And this is a protein called glucose binding protein. What do you think this protein does? It binds to glucose, and glucose is a sugar, and that's pretty sweet, because you, did you catch that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we'll try again next time. <laughs> Glucose binding protein is amazing because it's structured kind of like a Pac-Man, right? Here's glucose, that's this little ring right here. And when glucose finds its way inside the Pac-Man's mouth, the protein clamps on it, closes on it, and now the bacteria can eat it. And that's good, you know, glucose is good, it's a source of food, then it can move around, can make energy, it can infect us, right, if it is that kind of bacteria. And not only that, what's really cool about this is that bacteria can follow their noses. Take a look at what's happening here. At the very, very tip, somewhere at the very top here, this glucose binding protein is searching for glucose. And as it finds glucose, 
it's sending a message all the way down to the tail through a series of proteins and chemical reactions all the way down to tell the tail to wiggle. The tail is known as a flagellum and it's like a corkscrew and it spins like a boat motor. Like a boat motor. So essentially this protein at the very very tip here is telling them this, the entire cell which way to go. It's kind of like a small rudder on a giant ship telling it where to go. If it finds glucose it's going to keep moving more. And there are other proteins that will try to find toxins or bad things. And, and if they find it, they'll say, no, no, go the other way. We don't want to be here. Right. And so following your nose by sniffing your way around. And this doesn't just happen with bacteria. If we look at something else, like sperm, for example, they also have, does this look familiar? This is the smell receptor. In fact, there are two places in our bodies where we have these smell receptors. Inside of our noses and on sperm because they can sniff their way around to find an unfertilized egg and that's exactly the same way. It, let's zoom out a little bit more. This is a fish. It's a salmon, right? Salmon have this incredible ability that after they have reached maturity, they leave the ocean and they go back upstream and they find the one stream where they spawned, where they hatched. And how do they do it? They follow their nose. They have these olfactory receptors. The same thing that we see from bacteria all the way to salmon. The simple, same simple mechanism here where you have a sniffer at the very, at the very top and a tail that's going to move you towards where you want to go. So we talked about our smell receptors. There's about a thousand. Our taste receptors, we have about five different types. What about our eyesight? Just three. Just three for color. Just three for color reception. That's it. All the colors that you see, all of them, come from the action of three types of the receptors. And you can see the entire spectrum of the rainbow. And the three respond to three different colors. Red, green, and blue. And because they overlap, we can see all the colors in between. Because they overlap, we can see all the colors in between. So if you, if you turn on one of them, just one, then you'll see one color. If you turn on both of them, you'll see some color that's in between and so on. And this way, you can see the continuum of colors that we can see. Just three. So how does this actually work? When we talked about our smell receptors and our taste receptors, we made our hands look like this, right? And we grabbed onto a ball, you know, molecule, whether it's in the air or in the food that we eat. But what about color receptors. What are they actually grabbing onto? They're not grabbing anything, they're just perceiving light. And light, if you're a chemist, light is not a thing. <laughs> it's a thing you use to do stuff with. But it's not a molecule, right? It's not a molecule, so you can't grab it. So how does it work? How do you grab light? How do you grab it? I don't know. You try to catch, catch light. You can't, right? But there's a clever way that they do this. Take a look at what's inside this protein. What's inside this protein is this smaller molecule right here. This is a pigment molecule. It's a pigment molecule. This is derived from vitamin A. Vitamin A is found in foods like carrots, for example. This is why they tell you, eat your carrots so that you get better eyesight. You ever hear that? Or am I the only one who was told that? All right. You could tell I, I didn't really eat a lot of carrots. Why is that? Because we take the, the pigments that are in the carrot and we modify them and we stick them inside the proteins that help us see the three different colors of light or all the different colors of light. And what does that do? Well, here's what happens. When the light waves come in and they hit the receptor, the, the pigment goes from a, uh, a bent structure to straightened out structure, just straightens out by the action of the light. And that's all it takes. That's all it takes. Because as it does that, it changes the shape of the protein. It makes it kind of wiggle around a little bit. 
And that's really all that you need because one wiggle will turn on the wiggle for another protein and another protein and another protein. And it's like this giant Rube Goldberg machine. One thing hitting another and one thing hitting another all the way until it gets to your nerves and an electric pulse will go to the brain in the part that respons that's responsible for eyesight. And that's gonna say green and you're gonna see green. So it's all about the wiggle all about the wiggle because of this pigment that absorbs the light and changes its shape, pushing the protein around. Now, of course, as it turns out, we can't see all the colors. We can see all the colors that we can see, but we can't see any of the colors that we can't see. Is this an obvious statement? Yes, it is, but that is just to say that there's so many colors that we can't see, like ultraviolet, you know, we call it black lights. What's a black light? I mean, it's because we can't see it, right? It's UV, it's ultraviolet. But guess who can see it? Bees can see uh, ultraviolet. They, can't, they don't have a red receptor, so they can't see red. So if you, if you put them in a, uh, in a box that, uh, that is clear to us, but has like red clear or like red um, plastic that you can see through, they won't be able to see through because they can't see red but they can see ultraviolet, a light that we can't see. And what happens is that nature can actually take advantage of this because the bees can see the UV light that's reflecting from uh, something like a sunflower right here, and they can see patterns that we can't see. And if you look at a lot of flowers under ultraviolet light, you'll see all these patterns that look like bullseyes so that the bee can actually find its way right to the center where the nectar is and of course from the point of view of the flower where the pollen is. So it can grab the pollen, go to the next flower and the next flower and the next flower. Things that we can see but they can see. Dogs, we talked about dogs, right? Our annoying wonderful friends. They have a legendary sense of smell but Unlike us, three, you know, the three color receptors, they only have two color receptors. You know, you, you hear about uh, dogs being colorblind. Maybe you've heard that dogs are colorblind. Well, it's not that they can see things in black and white. I mean, nobody really knows what they see, but we think that they see things in shades of yellow and blue. But they can't really tell the difference between green or red or any of those colors. Uh, gazelles or deer, walking around in the forest, if there's a tiger that's hiding behind the long grasses, the deer can't see the difference between the orange stripes and the green stripes of the grasses. It's perfect camouflage for a tiger, especially if it's hunting something that can't tell the difference between green and orange. Right? But here's the record holder. The record holder for photoreceptors for light receptors, color receptors, is the mantis shrimp, this beautiful painting here by Maggie Fink. The mantis shrimp has 12 different photoreceptors, 12 different photoreceptors. We think that we can distinguish about 10 million different colors and 10 million different shades, right? If you have all functioning three color receptors, just with three color receptors, you get about 10 million shades. Can you imagine how much more you would see with 12? Now, we can try to imagine what the mantis shrimp actually can see, but it's hard to tell because they also have very tiny brains and you need brain to be able to process all that information. But nonetheless, there's evidence that they can see ultraviolet light and they can even see polarized light. What's polarized light? Well, let's think about it this way. Light waves are vibrations and light waves can be vibrating this way, up and down, as they move towards you, or they can be moving sideways as they move towards you, right? And that's the polarization of the light. It's the angle at which it's moving at you. If it's moving up and down like this, versus moving sideways, then it's offset by about 90 degrees. And you have about 360 degrees, so you can have polarized light in any angle, right? in any angle. We can't tell the difference. To us, light is light. We just look and we see uh, blue, uh, red, that's it. But there is evidence that the mantis shrimp can actually see the different 
polarization of the light, the angle at which the light is traveling at it. Why would you need that? Well, we really don't know. We really don't know. But there's evidence that maybe that's more helpful seeing underwater. Because the way light travels in water, it can maintain its polarization a little bit more than light traveling in air scattering all over the place. Still, why would you need all of that? Well, the ocean is a pretty hostile place. This thing is quite a hunter, right? It can wait for prey. It can even change its own color. And we know that there are lots of, lots of organisms in the ocean that can change their own color. They can blend in with the environment. So you really have to have a keen eyesight. And who better does that than this guy right here? Right. The octopus, the master of disguise. We've all seen these videos. Have you seen these videos before of an octopus just like it's swimming around and then finds a rock and just goes and it just blends right in, changing its color and now you can't see it. It's pretty cool. It's really amazing how it does that. And it does it very, very quickly and you think, how does it know that this part is going to turn yellow and that part is going to turn blue to match this part of the rock and that one's going to turn a little green? And when scientists looked at its eyes, they figured out that it turns out it's actually pretty colorblind. That an octopus can adopt colors that it can't even see. What? How does that even work? So then scientists looked even more and they looked at the octopus skin. And they found that on the octopus's skin, there are these photoreceptors just like the color receptors that we have in our eyes that expand its ability to see color. So in a way, the octopus seeing with its skin. This part needs to be yellow, so it's going to be yellow. This part needs to be blue, so it's going to be blue. This part needs to be green. I have, what, eight more, <laughs> right? Seven more. <laughs> right, how many legs? So, all of those parts can do their own thing based on what the skin is seeing. But is the skin really seeing? I mean, let's, let's really make a distinction here between two things, between vision and light detection. What we do with our eyes is vision. We make an image of somebody. I look over there and I see J. So I know this is J because there's an image of J. There's a head, glasses, a goatee, and a shirt, and so on, right? That's an image. I'm creating an image using my eyes. But light detection is not the same as, as vision. All you have to do is be receptive to light and react to it in one way or another. My skin will react to light. If I stay out in the sun for a long time, I'm going to start to tan. That must be detected somehow, right? But it doesn't mean that my skin makes an image of what I'm seeing, right? And so there is a difference here between vision and light detection. And most likely what's happening on the octopus's skin is this idea of a light detection. They're not necessarily making an image, but they're trying to match the environment based on the wavelength or the color of light that they're receiving from its surroundings. And so it turns out that light detection is actually quite ancient in of itself. So even before the type of proteins that we have in our eyes even came about, there are even more ancient proteins called cryptochromes. And the cryptochromes have this shape right here. Proteins are very squiggly. They're super squiggly, which is super cool. They're a lot of fun. And one thing that cryptochromes do in bacteria, like billions and billions of years ago, whatever, uh, bacteria were able to use it, they still use it to this day, to detect ultraviolet uh, light, because ultraviolet light can be damaging to DNA. They always tell you, you know, put sunscreen because you don't want to get skin cancer, because ultraviolet light can damage DNA. And it can do that in bacteria too. Well, they detect that damage, they detect that using the light. They say, okay, there's a lot of UV, that means there's going to be some DNA damage, and they go over there and they fix the DNA, because any problem with DNA is going to be inherited in the next generation, next generation, and you don't want that, right? So this is one of the most ancient things that we've done, that our bacteria cousins have done with light detection. Turns out that the very same cryptochromes, slightly different, slightly different, right? Slightly different cryptochromes survived and were passed down to plants. 
plants use cryptochromes to grow towards the light. So instead of using cryptochromes to fix DNA, in plants, cryptochromes are also used to detect light, but instead to grow towards it and to detect the season's changes. So hopefully now, the days are going to start to get longer, thank goodness, right? because we are on that side, <laughs> that side of the world. And as they do that, then plants will detect that light, the shortening of the nights and the, you know, the uh, prolonging days and are going to switch into spring mode. Let's grow and make more. So timing. Another thing that we do with cryptochromes is that we use it for our day-night sleep cycle. So cryptochromes are in our eyes, side by side to our photoreceptors, to our color receptors, and they help us actually determine whether it's daytime or nighttime. And they reset our circadian cycle, circadian cycle, our day-night cycle. So this is why we feel groggy when it's gloomy outside. Right? And when you're jet lagged, they tell you to do what? Go outside, go in the sun, get some sunlight so that you can reset your light. Because your cryptochromes need light so they can reset your brain. But here's the most amazing thing, in my opinion, that cryptochromes do. And in migratory birds, things like the European robin or the zebra finch, they can actually do something quite crazy. And this gets into the realm of what's called quantum biology. Right? And what happens is that cryptochromes can actually help these birds see the magnetic, uh, the magnetic pull of the Earth, the magnetic field of the Earth. So as they try to fly, they can actually look and see whether they're looking at north or south, or east, or west. And to them, as far as we're concerned, as far as we can tell, because this goes to the, the visual part of their brain, they can actually see a color associated with north or south. That's the common thought right now. The same kind of cryptic chromes have been changed, uh, changed a bit here and there, from bacteria, to plants, to humans, to these migratory birds, telling them which way to go. They need light and they need a magnet. That's all they need, and they will find their way. And so, everywhere we look, there are these superhuman senses. We have our five or six senses, really. There's actually six. And they're all mediated by proteins. We talked about sight, we talked about taste, and we talked about smell and all have these proteins at the forefront. But everything else also uses proteins because proteins do almost everything in our bodies, almost everything in our bodies. And they do almost everything in the bodies of these animals, like whales, which can detect sound signals from hundreds of miles away. And uh, echolocation with bats, you know, they send these little sound, uh, sound signals in dark caves and they can judge distance that way. That would be cool, wouldn't it? Right? Talk about a superpower. Right? What superpower do you want? Right? How about that? Sharks can detect electrical signals so they can find prey by the electrical signals that are found in their prey. You know, we all have electricity running through us and they can actually detect electrical signals. And we're not even sure where that is or how they do it. So there's still so much to be discovered. Pit vipers, have you heard of pit vipers? You know why they're called pit vipers? Because they have pits, these two little holes right in, uh, below their eyes, and these pits actually detect infrared light. Again, another color that we can't see. But infrared comes off of anything that has heat. So any hot body. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not this guy, clearly. <laughs> so if there's a mouse, <laughs> there's a mouse, in the complete darkness, right, it's always going to be emitting, emitting heat, and they can actually make an image out of it in infrared. <laughs> Very nice. Right. So there are all these superhuman senses, and they're all mediated and communicated by a whole host of proteins that connect everything in our bodies, from our brains to our, you know, our, our senses, all the way out to our extremities. Now, 
what can proteins really do? And this probably would be a whole other talk by itself because this gets into the realm of what I like myself is protein engineering. Can we take proteins with you know, the, the natural functions that, we, that they already have and change them so that they can do something even cooler? As if that, you know, looking at it, as if seeing in the dark is not cool enough or sending sound signals and receiving them is not cool enough. Can we do something new with them? Well, we're already doing that. And for example, something that you may have done is that you've used proteins to detect COVID-19. If you've ever taken a COVID-19 test, anybody had taken it? Yeah, you don't need to. Too soon? Too soon. And what happens is that there are antibodies that recognize the virus in the test strip. These are proteins. And if you've ever done like a PCR test, anybody heard of the PCR test for the COVID-19? PCR test uses proteins to actually make more of the genetic material of the virus so that we can say, yes, we have this virus or we have something else or we don't have anything. All right, so proteins are already used for detection. In my lab, we're using proteins to detect toxins in the environment. And here's the new revolution in proteins, which is what's called biologics. Anybody heard of biologics before? These, this is so-called protein-based therapy. Now, when you look at the typical medicines that you would have on your shelf, Tylenol, ibuprofen, you know, something like that, those are chemical, what we call chemical therapies. And they're really good for your headache or for nausea or for whatever, right? But when you get into like more complex diseases like cancers or uh, uh, autoimmune diseases like IBS, for example, those are very difficult and we have chemical therapies for them. In fact, they're called chemotherapies and we all know that those have very severe side effects sometimes. Now what we're gearing towards is using proteins as therapies for these difficult diseases and using them hopefully will help decrease these side effects because proteins can be very specific, targeting just what they want without harming anything else, right? And this is a new revolution that's happening with immune therapy, with uh, protein-based therapy for a lot of diseases. And you've probably seen the ads for Humira. This is one of the most commonly used uh, protein-based therapies out there. So there's so much more to do and there's not enough time to do it all. I'm just really lucky to be involved with any kind of research that's, that, that does anything with proteins. And I'm also fortunate to be able to make art out of it. So that's the fun part. And with that, I just want to thank my partner in all of this, Maggie Fink, who's done some of the drawings that you've seen, especially the colored ones. Uh, and together, we're actually writing the book that uh, Dr. Marr told you about. And uh, this is our uh, social media presence. If you're interested in, in taking a look at it, please uh, take a look. It's just a lot of drawings and, and approachable science. I want to thank, oh, yeah, Maggie is actually a uh, PhD student, PhD candidate at the University of Notre Dame. She also graduated from IUSB, so she's really bridging both uh, institutions here. I want to thank Dr. Marr for helping put all of this together and Tammy Freeling. IUSB Chemistry and Biochemistry, my colleagues, my peeps, they're awesome. Thank you guys. And um, Public Library, thank you for hosting us. And also all of the funding agencies, National Science Foundation, the Research Corporation for Science, for, uh, Science Advancement, the Burroughs Welcome Fund. These foundations and these organizations have really been very, very much interested in what we're doing with, uh, at the intersection of art and science, telling stories, and engaging the public with it. And you know we've been just fortunate to get their support. And I wanna thank you all for coming here on a Tuesday uh, evening. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so the question is, uh, can you explain the effect of COVID-19 on taste and, and smell? I don't think that's actually been quite worked out. I saw a headline, so I, please don't quote me on that because I did not check my sources. I did not check my sources. So all I saw was a headline, so I'd have to verify this. But uh, what it suggested is that our own immune response is attacking uh, the taste and smell 
uh, centers in our noses. I, that's about as far as I read, but it was a mystery for a long time, and I think it's still being worked out. That's my understanding. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. So, great question. When you can't smell, you can't taste, right? This is actually a really, really good uh, point. Uh, usually, when you have a cold, your nasal cavity will swell up. You can't breathe. There's not a whole lot of air that can move up. So that renders your, your smell receptors not really useful, right? Uh, and your food will taste bland because food taste relies almost entirely on smell. Think about the number of receptors we have for smell versus the number of receptors for, for taste. You can do this experiment at home. Jelly beans. This is a famous experiment. Jelly beans. You have people smell one jelly bean, blindfold them, smell one jelly bean, feed them the other one. And they'll be thoroughly confused. Very, very confused. You could do this with apples and pears. Have them smell the pear or, and, and eat the apple or the other way around because they're both sweet. They both have the same kind of texture, right? Uh, but the, the only difference or the main difference is the smell. And that's what gives you the whole ambiance of the meal that you're eating is actually the smell. The smell is really important for taste. So thank you for that point. We had one question here and then we'll go there. Yes. Your, uh, <clears throat> your molecule that you showed, the, the protein, yeah. how many amino acids would make that up? Tens, hundreds, thousands? Right, that's a very good question. I'm gonna repeat it here for the camera again. So the question was that protein that we saw, the taste receptor, how many amino acids would make it up? That one, I, I'm, it, it's about 300. 300 or so, 300, 400 amino acids. So it's in the hundreds, in the short, you know, in the low hundreds would make that. There are some proteins that are made of thousands of amino acids. Long proteins that are muscles, for example, thousands of amino acids, very long fibers, right? Again, they're still microscopic and very, very tiny. And there are proteins that are very, very small. They're only about five or six or seven amino acids long. Like the endorphins that are released when you're running, right? Uh, if you run, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, if you eat spicy food, I eat spicy food, right? And you really push yourself and you get through it. And, you know, the response to pain is these endorphins that get released. These are very short proteins that go to receptors. And these are called opioid receptors, right? And they're the same receptors that receive things like opium, right? But opium is much, much stronger than the small, tiny proteins that we make that we call endorphins, right? So, but it's the same, same, same thing, same thing. So you're essentially drugging yourself. This is why I love spicy food so much. Uh, yes? I'd like to go back to the uh, slide you showed with DNA uh -huh. and the instruction manual for putting together that furniture. Yes, yes. That, so we're, we're going back to the slide of putting, back, putting together that IKEA furniture. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. But nobody reads the instructions. Nobody reads the instructions. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's true. Now. Unfortunately, we cannot build proteins without reading the instructions, right? We just, we simply can't. In fact, and it's men that don't read instructions. It's men that don't read instructions, right, right. Absolutely, it's men that don't read instructions. But we, we simply cannot uh, make proteins without reading the instructions in DNA. That is that, but, but it's, a, it's a great question. Here's, here's, what, here's the spin that I will put on that, is that if there's a problem with the instructions, there will be problems, most likely, with the function. And this is what happens with mutations, right? The word mutation is a change in DNA, and it almost always results in a change, not always, but almost always results in a change in the protein that comes out. And sometimes that change is minor, you won't feel it. Sometimes the change is somewhere in the middle, sometimes the change is in major, and it can cause disease or disability or cancer, and so on. If this happens in the middle of your life, right, this can trigger a disease. If this is something you're born with, then it's a disease you're born with. It's a genetic thing. So it could be genetic or environmental. Right? But a change in DNA usually, almost always, will have a change in, in protein. Not always, but yeah. We can't have absolutes, yes. So with AI and like solving different foldings of proteins, yes. where do you see the science of that leading? 
Oh, that's a very good question. Let me repeat it again. So uh, what, what is the role of AI now, or where do we see AI in terms of solving these protein structures? N let me back up a little bit for our, the sake of our audience. Right? It takes lots of years of work to determine the structure of these proteins. It's not a trivial thing. Uh, sequencing a DNA now is cheaper than buying a pack of gum, right? But uh, actually determining the structure of a protein, those structures that, that we put up, is very difficult. Uh, we happen to have about a few tens of thousands or, of structures that are known, somewhere around there, maybe a couple hundred thousand structures that are known, right? But that's a small amount of all the proteins and all the organisms and all the, you know, we, we don't even know the structure of all of our proteins. Some are just very difficult to, to, to be able to get the structure of. Now, the role of AI is coming in to take just the sequence of the protein, the, the arrangement of amino acids, and based on that, det determine the structure. And, and there's a huge revolution that's happening. And I'm planning to actually assign my students something about that. I haven't decided what it is yet. Because it is really going to be the new thing. It is really going to be the new thing. Is it always going to be 100% correct? No, just like everything else. I don't think it's always going to be 100% correct. But it's going to help immensely, right? If it gets us 80% of the way, 70% of the way, even 50% of the way, that's a huge, huge advance in our understanding of, of protein structure. Why do we need protein structure? Because when you know its structure, you can figure out its function or you can modulate its function by a drug molecule or some sort of intervention, right? If you don't know what a chair looks like, uh, can you build one? You can't. Can you fix one? You can't, right? So knowing the structure is immense. Does that answer your question? Any other questions here? Yes? I think this is a science fiction question. A science fiction question. All right. So if we, could, if we have sensors capable of receiving and distinguishing thousands of different things, we don't have language for those thousands of different things. Um, is there is there some is there some way to improve the language so that there's language for those thousands of different things? I love this question. I'm going to repeat it for the sake of the the crowd and for the camera, uh, and I'm, hopefully I can do it justice. If we have receptors for thousands of things, we probably don't have the language to describe all of those things. I would agree with that. We don't. I mean, the, I think that even as a writer, you are a writer as well, you know that language sometimes will just get stuck. We all know we have these feelings that we can never, ever have words for. So what do we do? We invent a word. So I would say on one end, on one side of it, Yes, we're always going to be stumped because language is as beautiful as it is. It's, uh, it's a construct that we invented. It's a shorthand. But on the other hand, I think it's really cool to dream about all the different words that we can come up with all the feelings that are yet to be discovered. Maybe. I like that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Yes. So this is, this is the odd um, lawyer looking at this and saying, how does this work? Yes. Um, so you've got the amino acids, and the AI may be able to say, if you have these amino acids in this sequence, but it's like a recipe. If you give me a list of ingredients, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to come out with the cake. I could come out with a glob of glue, which is usually what I do. But, you know, it's the... Is there a way that they're looking at the, the amino acids in a certain order that tells them the instructions on how to build it? Because the, they don't all look the same. So you, you actually made a very good, uh, you put it in a very good way. So the question is, uh, you know, how does the AI take a bunch of amino acids and from that make a structure of a protein? It would be much similar to a recipe. Here's some flour and eggs and... I don't, I don't, I don't bake. So whatever, I, I, I cook, but I don't bake. So here's all this stuff, right? But you said something that I think is key to it, the order, the order of things. Uh, so for all of the organisms, I'm just going to make a blanket statement here. Every organism out there, we have 20 amino acids to choose from, 
to construct all of the proteins that you can ever imagine. There's 20 amino acids. So at, every, at each position, you can have one of 20 amino acids. It's like 20 colors in a crayon box, right? But what's nice about it with, with uh, DNA sequencing is that if we know the sequence of the DNA, if we know the, the instructions, right, then we can know the order in which the amino acids are there. That's still a very difficult problem because even knowing the order won't tell you won't tell us with our current technology what the protein is going to look like, maybe a very small protein, but when you have proteins that are hundreds or thousands of amino acids long, that's where AI can actually help out because it can learn. And that's really, as my, my limited understanding of AI, is that it learns. It's learning from learning sets. So it can just sit there and look through 10,000 different protein structures and find these patterns that may or may not exist, but find the patterns that our traditional computing doesn't find, and certainly we can't find. Now, I wanna take it to a different level here, the statistical level, right? If you look at every single position, and at every single position, you can put one of 20 different colors or 20 different amino acids. How many possibilities do you have in an amino acid sequence that's even 10 amino acids long? It's an immense number because it's 20 times 20 times 20 times 20 times 20, you know, 10 times, right? So even to make all the different combinations for a protein that's even just 100 amino acids long, to make all the different combinations, there's not enough matter in the universe to make all of those, which tells us that all the proteins that every organism that's ever lived has made is a very, very small fraction of all the proteins that can be made. And this I'll bring back to being a protein engineer. That just means opportunity, right? I can make all kinds of new proteins. Most of them are gonna be garbage, just like words. Think about words. You can put, how many letters do we have in English? 26 letters, right? You could put one of 26 letters, but not all of them are gonna make sense. Not all of them are, making, are gonna make sense. So AI is gonna try to say, what makes sense with this sequence, with this language, to give us a word that looks like this, right? Going back to language again. Yeah, I'm from medicine, so the comment well taken. We do not yet have an AI, um, we have a lot of data on modeling, but we do not yet have an AI ethics framework, but we're working on it to try to get to the difference between precision versus personalized, so that's a really good question. My question is, we're moving beyond the human genome project now to full genome of animal life. Do you think that is gonna help us also? Do you see you know, tremendous outlay improving? Right, so, so the, the question is we're moving away from just the human genome and looking at the genome of other organisms. Actually, I remember the moment that, uh, that the bacterial E. coli, anybody heard of E. coli before, that it was sequenced. I was a college student and it was 1997 and I was sitting in microbiology class and that's when it was announced to us, right? So in fact, we have sequenced other genomes of other things that are, I'm gonna put it in quotes, simpler than us. I, I think bacteria are much cooler than us, but yeah, we're, we'll call them simpler than us way before we actually had uh, the Human Genome Project, which happened in around 2000, right? And that wasn't even a complete genome. That was like, we got almost everything there, right? Now there's more refinement of it. Now, what is the benefit of actually, you know, like sequencing the platypus and, you know, the, the horse and the, you know, there's a lot of benefits anywhere you look because, again, we talked about these amazing proteins that can do really cool things we have a new opportunity for therapeutic proteins, which means we can take a protein from this organism that does this thing here that we don't know how to do or it's missing from us and we can do it. In agriculture, right, to feed more people, our planet is exploding with people. Biotechnology, hopefully, if, if done ethically, is really a hope to be able to feed everybody on the planet in an equitable way, right? If you're talking about animal breeding, you know, how do you make sure that your animals don't get sick every time there's a drought or every time there's, you know, there's a disease, or, you know. So all of these things are very important. And those are just a few things that I can think of off the top of my head, right? So therapeutics, food security, and animal, uh, you know, and, and our pets too, right? Those dogs, again. <laughs> yes, Jay. 
I love hearing about the, the super senses, the other senses we don't know. Yeah. Um, and it's going to stick with me that sperm can sell or smell and skin can see. Are there others that you know of that are unusual? Like, like can our lungs hear? Are there <laughs> that can our know? lungs hear? Uh, I think I will probably, um, I don't know, without the, the sounding too much like a Dr. Seuss thing, you know, can, can my lung can hear, you know. Um, I think every organ in our body, every cell in our body can sense its environment. So when you look, I, I just want to go back to, I think this is a very compelling um, image right here. Take a look at this. Sorry, going back to this right here. These seven, uh, we call them transmembrane domains because we have to come up with fancy words because we're scientists, right? We want to just seem much cooler because, you know, we're so, so insecure about how cool we are. So we try to be cooler. So we call these seven transmembrane domains. This is a very important family of proteins that are not only important for how we see our world externally, but they're also important of how we sense our world internally. So related to these is things like the adrenaline receptor, right? That's on the surface of your, your heart cells and your muscle cells and you know, your lungs and so on. It receives adrenaline and you decide whether to fight or most likely in my case, flight. I mean, you know, so, <laughs> so this is, this is a, everything senses its environment. The uh, serotonin receptor, Everybody heard of serotonin? Serotonin is very important in regulating our mood and sleep and, you know, depression. When you're depressed, it's just typically oh, you're not making enough serotonin. It's not sticking around. You know what else it binds to? It binds to LSD, the hallucinogen, the same receptor. It, they both push the same button. They both push the same button, but the outcome is different because of the next proteins and the next proteins and the next chemical reactions and the next chemical reactions, right? Which puts into question, you know, whether serotonin is hallucinogen or not, and it's telling us that life is good when it's really not. I don't know, right? That's a whole other philosophical thing. But every cell feels something. Every cell has to interact with the world around it. It has to receive signals and do something with them somehow. Something with them somehow. So yes, we don't have the words to describe what serotonin binding to a serotonin receptor is called, but we have something called sight when light interacts with our eyes. The same kinds of proteins, just modified slightly. But the architecture is the same for most of these receptors. These are not the only types of receptors, right? There are many, but this family is very, very important. Oh man, we have a bunch of, let's start with Grace. Yes, I was Grace. I just wondering, so when people are colorblind, yes. are there those three receptors, are they one of them is damaged or, it's, or it's, they're missing one of them? Yeah, so colorblindness, yes. Uh, I will say yes to both. So the question is, if somebody's colorblind, does that mean that they're missing one or it's damaged somehow? The answer is yes. Uh, it's usually, there's some sort of mutation, right? So again, the instructions are not, are not right. And what happens is that then the receptor is not functioning uh, properly. So you're either not getting enough signal, so you're not really seeing enough of that green, or you're not seeing it at all, and you can't tell the difference between green and red, or uh, white and yellow, or different shades of blue, depending on, again, the sequence of the protein really determines what you can see. Right. So yeah, colorblindness has to do with the dysfunction in those three, in one of those three. Yes? So Synesthesia. Synesthesia. Yes. yes. So is that just the pathways in the brain or does that also have something to do with the receptors? Right. That's a great question. So is synesthesia uh, has to do with the pathways in the brain or the receptors? The, the answer to that, I don't know. I can't say with authority. My guess, again, this is a guess, is that it has to do with the wiring as opposed to the actual receptors. But guess what's happening in the wiring? It's a series of proteins communicating to each other. Hey, it's this, hey, it's that, right? But if the wires are crossed, then the signal enters uh, when you see the color green to the output that says Wednesday, right? So you're seeing Wednesday when it's green or you're whatever, right? Yes? 
Is there a science to our intuitions, like the sixth? Yes, so science to our intuition. Uh, I'm a man, so I'm not going to be able to really answer that. <laughs> because I'm not, I, I can't. No, I, uh, I think that we limit ourselves. Uh, this, is, this is just my own personal. This is not science, science saying. This is my own personal view. Is that I think we limit ourselves, again, by language, by saying we have these five senses or six senses. There's actually six senses, by the way. There's one, the one sense that tells you whether you're upright or upside down, right? That is a sense, right? So we actually have six. But I know what you're talking about, that intuition, right? Just like AI, AI is artificial intelligence, which is mirrored on human intelligence in a very basic way. It learns and applies without necessarily knowing why it's doing what it's doing, but because of a learning data set. So as we get older, they say we get wiser. I'm still trying to <laughs> prove that. <laughs> but you know, as we get older, we get more experience. Our learning set becomes bigger, right? So maybe that's what we call intuition. Some people are just quicker at it. Some people are not. Maybe there's proteins involved. I don't know. Receptors or uh, receptors, yeah. And and the wiring and all the connections, right? We're just we're literally just scratching the surface with this talk. Any other questions? Yes. You didn't touch on uh, hearing or feel. Yes. I'm wondering if that's because it's less involved with proteins or? It's just as involved with proteins. So hearing and touch, right? So actually, a more recently uh, discovered uh, receptors are called piezoreceptors. They, they feel pressure, right? And they're pretty cool because they, they, they have different structures, but they kind of, I don't know how to describe their structure. They almost look like uh, uh, the Chinese finger cuffs, right? When you push them, they kind of splay out a little bit. And as they splay out, right, they send a signal and saying, oh, there's pressure there, right? Uh, so uh, all the senses involve proteins, even if it's not necessarily the receptor itself. All the wiring, all the signals, they're always chemical reactions, and almost all of the chemical reactions that happen in our bodies are mediated by proteins that we call enzymes. Right? So, so the next thing that happens after light hits this or after you know smell it is a series of enzymatic reactions. There's hundreds of other proteins that are involved in just transmitting a signal. So, like I said, we're just scratching the surface. Anything else? Okay, let's thank Shahir. Thank you guys. And let's think about what's coming up next. So do you remember the date? Oh, good. Um, so on, please join us on February 7th, uh, we'll be thinking more about DNA, but from a different perspective, thinking about uh, genetic counseling and how it affects health treatments. So please join us. I think we will be in this room on February 7th. And um, thanks so much, here for a wonderful talk. <laughs>